I just, uh, I'd almost like to hear more of your opinion about, you know, possibly an economy being limited to growth or, you know, things like religion and how they're going to really impact, you know, people being enlightened and that sort of thing. Fairly general <laughs> question. <laughs> well, uh, the economic limits, I think, are, th there are always possible finite limits to economic growth in that, you know, we could be whacked by an asteroid, uh, we could have human and, uh, or natural catastrophes or one sort or another that would send us back to the dark ages and, and limit future economic growth. Short of those kinds of catastrophes, however, uh, the kinds of limits to growth that most people seem to focus on are resource constraints like the end of oil. And I think what we're already seeing is that the end of oil um, expectations were premature and uh, will turn out to be uh, incorrect because the economic interest in other sources of petroleum products ramped up as the, the easier ones went away. And um, as solar pa panels become cheaper and more available, those will begin to become a source of power. And so many of the ideas that we may have energy constraints or other kinds of resource constraints, I think had, just given the history of those kinds of Malthusian anxieties in the past, have not played out um, to, to be true. But that doesn't mean to say that we're not a finite species, because we are, and if we were hit by the right kind of rock or the right kind of solar flare or something, then, then all bets would be off. Um, in terms of the role of religion, I have a much more complex, uh, my gut is, uh, is hard atheist or new atheist, but my head is much more complex in that uh, as a sociologist, I'm very aware that religion is not an ideological or um, a theological matter for most people. It's a matter of social relationships. And so for the vast majority of people, when they say that they believe in God or that they have a commitment to a religion, it's not in fact um, that they have thought at all about the theological questions. And in fact, when you dig, you scratch a little bit <laughs> into most contemporary Christian theologies, they don't hold many of the, core, what were considered core doctrines, that many of them would have been burned as heretics in the past, for the professions that you know people other than Christians could get into heaven and so forth. Now that's probably not true of kids graduating from madrasas in Pakistan or Afghanistan or someplace like that. I think there are places where uh, ideological rigidity it goes much deeper and, and you have, um, the, it's a much greater barrier to progress. But I, one of the things that's happened in the last 400 years around the Enlightenment is that the Enlightenment started by among mostly religious thinkers. They were trying to validate how uh, reason and science showed God's plan and how you could intuit God's plan through reason and science. And so uh, there is a tradition of religious thought within the Enlightenment that uh, is parallel to secularism and atheism. Uh, and uh, I think what I see among any of my um, putatively secular friends, especially the transhumanist ones, the ones who are willing to entertain thoughts about um, the ultimate purpose and meaning of human existence, is that they end up in a theological place, most of them, or at least a, a, a religious place, if not theological. You know, Nick Bostrom, very secular atheist guy, through an entirely secular train of thought, ends up at the conclusion that we might be living inside a giant science experiment of some uh, alien, malevolent or friendly, who knows, but, uh, and that's a kind of theological thought. So, you know, I, I just don't see the hard and fast distinctions that a lot of the new atheists do. Um, but as I say, my gut is still new atheist. I, I do sometimes wake up in the morning and think, what can I do to piss off the Christian right today? <laughs> Okay, uh, other questions? Come on, you guys, this is a unique opportunity. Ross, you look moved, moved to move. <laughs> ah, Ro Ross, is, Ross is coming with his laptop. This, this may be a more complex and specific 
question. So somehow, you, you have to uh, hold these things too, I guess. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I don't have a question, so I'm going to try and formulate one as I go here. But uh, one of the things that you said in the talk was that there's this uh, erosion of, of certainty when it comes to uh, moral certainty. And uh, in the context of another comment that you made in, in your speech, the, uh, I don't know how to put it nicely, but I'll put it the way that, that you did, the, uh, the Fox News group of people, is that a breakdown of moral certainty that they're having that leads them to these positions that are unreasonable, or is that some other kind of uh, deterioration in... Uh, in the fabric of reason. Well, one of the th one of the things that's happened as uh, let, let's just take a, a sociological or anthropological step back is that we used to live in these small tribal groups with very little interaction between those groups, uh, uh, linguistic interaction or cultural interaction, and then that began to change you know, five, six thousand years ago, and then with the growth of cities, two thousand, three thousand years ago, and then uh, the growth of trade since then. And every time those cultures would come into conflict with each other, some people would find those, uh, those clash of belief systems and religious views um, a cause for going deeper. You know, the, you think about the, the confrontation of Islamic and Greek and Jewish and Christian thought in the Middle Ages, um, it forced a lot of philosophers on all sides to go deeper into the, question, the religious questions that, um, that the others were answering better than they were in their own faiths. And um, on the other hand, uh, another one of the responses is to, if you can't handle that kind of ambiguity, you uh, reaffirm the fundamentalism, the closure, the ideological closure of your own belief system. And, and that probably goes back several ten, you know, 10,000 years as well uh, of people having a fundamentalist reaction to that kind of chaos. And then I think a, a third reaction that we could point to, uh, you know, in uh, uh, noting Emile Durkheim, is that some people just find the clash of views to be incredibly confusing and chaotic. It doesn't inspire them to become more complex, and it doesn't inspire them to become fundamentalist, it just inspires them to become anomic or to lose belief without any comp compensatory uh, advantage. And so those three different reactions, of course, we, we hope that people develop more and more complexity, but I think you can see in contemporary society as, you know, it's just one click away for you to find people who share exactly diametrically opposed views to whatever you, <laughs> you happen to believe in. Um, and that kind of um, confrontation, although we do our best to wall it off and to only read the blogs that agree with us and to only have Facebook friends who agree with us. I mean, I, I've literally only uh, unfriended people on Facebook because they say something I don't agree with politically. I just cannot tolerate that in my Facebook <laughs> stream. And, um, and I'm sure that that's true for a lot of people, that they just don't want to see that. So. Um, I think that between those, uh, what we're beginning to find out is that there are certain brains that are tuned to ideological closure and other brains that are tuned, and this is, this is my reference to Chris Mooney, his research on the, the Republican brain, and the fact, uh, it goes back to the 1940s and 50s, the research on the authoritarian personality, uh, the, the genes that t tend to make people liberals or conservatives, and, and this is a, the kind of pessimistic thought, which is that if these genes have been present in the human race for 10,000 years, what determined whether you ended up in the uh, fundamentalist camp in reaction to cultural clash and ideological clash, or you ended up in the more complex camp, may have been determined before you were born and not have anything to do with um, the kinds of arguments that people try to have. Um, but that's the pessimistic thought. I, I don't think that that's entirely true because I do think we've made progress and we haven't changed genetically that much. So um, at any rate, I, I do think that it is possible for us to move increasingly towards a more uh, complex world that takes account of the fact that there is no moral closure to be had, uh, that there is no way to, to find the laws of the universe or the Talmud or the the Ten Commandments or whatever written into the base of the universe, you know, written into the base code of, of the quark, 
Um, and therefore, we have to just acknowledge that we make this stuff up. We make right and wrong up. We make, uh, we make up uh, what's a better political system and a worse political system. And there's really no way to, to rationally validate it, except that we generally all seem to agree about certain kinds of things, and we can move on from there. OK. Uh, other questions that could include follow-up questions? Uh, so, yay. <laughs> okay. It's always good when I see somebody rise from a seat and come up front. OK. Yeah. So uh, you talked a little bit about um, progress, meaning um, things like the end of war, the end of uh, international conflicts, that sort of thing. And um, something that I was thinking about is um, what I've been currently sort of looking at on, on the internet in forms of uh, people with the idea of forming new world order at, sort of as a conspiracy thing, but more, I think, more relevantly, uh, people moving towards not necessarily a global government, but maybe lack of government and more personal governance. Um, and I was thinking, what is your standpoint on maybe an illusory um, sense of progress and the fact of uh, a political progress, things like uh, re-electing the same kinds of leaders, maybe people with those sort of more fundamentalist viewpoints get more votes and maybe that's just a fact of who we tend to be drawn to as leaders. Um, yeah, just sort of what is your opinion on sort of an illusory political or governmental progress? So progress that isn't really progress just is faking it. <laughs> well, as I say, I start from the point of view that it's really hard to validate rationally that anything is, in fact, progress. And yes. certainly, you know, just even the goal of the decline of violence and the growth of, uh, of uh, peaceful life is not something that all of our ancestors would have looked upon kindly, and there are people alive today who don't look upon it kindly, who think that uh, men uh, have to fight, uh, or at least be exposed to violence in order to become true men, and that the uh, feminization of the world through the elimination of violence has all kinds of deleterious consequences. So this is not a, a moral universal necessarily, it's just something that most people seem to agree with, that, um, that less war and less violence would be a good idea. Um, in terms of the global governance, I've been a world federalist since I was a teenager, and, um, and I, we just published a couple hours ago uh, the conclusion of a poll that we ran on our website at the IET about what kinds of political system people thought the world might have in uh, 90 years to 2100. And uh, the majority, 53%, said that it would either have a direct democracy through some kind of electronic mediation or directly elected uh, representatives, uh, representative democracy. Um, and so that was pretty good. But of course, we're a pretty optimistic bunch at the IAT, not at all representative of the world. Um, I, uh, in terms of the illusory nature of political progress, I, I think that one of the problems is that because we are constantly revising our moral uh, codes, we will look back on every previous epoch as having been morally bankrupt. I mean, I, in the United States, we look back on the founding fathers and all their highfalutin rhetoric about the equality of men and the fact that they owned slaves and didn't allow women to vote and et cetera, et cetera, you know, that they were just a bunch of hypocrites. Um, and every uh, generation up to the present, uh, you know, we'll look back on the fact that we eat meat, I'm sure, as a barbaric uh, custom. Um, I, I am not a, yet a vegetarian, so I'm sure I'll look back on myself that way if I live long enough. So um, in terms of the fact that we can't even get an international political consensus to stop genocide in the Sudan or in uh, Rwanda, uh, you know, in this contemporary world, uh, we'll, we'll look back on that with horror, um, I'm sure. 
And, uh, and I'm glad that we will, because I think that that is exactly the kind of progress that I hope that we achieve, is to, to have an, an increasingly higher standard on a higher bar of what kinds of political life we should have. Okay. So other questions? Uh, maybe at this point we'll, we'll go on to a little bit of the next uh, video. Does, does that suit you guys? I think it's uh, remarkable how many facets uh, James Hughes has. You know, when, when you look at this TED Talk, you can get a little concept of maybe, you know, the little world that he's in. But then when you listen to this other talk, you'll realize there's a whole lot more there, which, which, which is kind of cool. And I think it'll open up your mind to a lot of other things you could ask him about. So I'm, I'm just going to try to go to this uh, 20.05 here. Now is the time for me to ask you to share a little bit more without sort of uh, stealing your thunder and telling us everything, of course, about your upcoming book. Cyborg Buddha. Well, in in the first book, uh, Citizen Cyborg, I laid out a kind of fundamental ethical starting point premise, which, as I said, I I don't think that you can find this written in stone at the base of the universe. But um, the premise was, if you think that. Uh, human happiness is a good thing and that more human happiness is a good thing and you believe that people having more control over their lives and their societies uh, leads to more human happiness then here's the propositions that I would see flowing from that in terms of how to build a, a progressive transhumanist movement a progressive transhumanist politics um, and uh, that is a pretty simple minded I, I'm very influenced by John Stuart Mill in that and, and uh, argued for Mill's position around human freedom and human choice in, in, that, in that book. Um, but then I started to teach a course here at Trinity on uh, uh, happiness and public policy. And th th this, over the last decade, the literature on ha human happiness and in particular its application to public policy has been exploding. And I began to realize that um, the naivete of my own utilitarianism um, and the difficulty of, of uh, especially for a transhumanist, of trying to um, have human happiness as a goal, because eventually we're all going to have wires and, and little nano pharmacies in our brains that will be able to give us any mood or experience we want, and you could be lying in the gutter and you know land at the lotus eaters and, and be perfectly happy. So, from a transhumanist point of view, it's extremely problematic because of wireheading. Um, and uh, I know that uh, David Pierce and I have a bit of a disagreement about this, uh, about the hedonistic imperative here about that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I do think that there is a way to have a kind of sophisticated goal of, of happiness. So the beginning point of the book is to try to tease back apart this question of what kinds of happiness are true kinds of happiness that would be legitimate aspirations for our society in the era of neurotechnology. Um, and what, what do we know about human happiness? And it basically boils back down to the distinction between hedonism and eudaimonia. So Aristotle had this notion that there was a kind of happiness which comes from actual accomplishment and the maturation of, of human character um, that is different from simply wireheading or taking crack. And, um, and that that is, I think, what we need to recognize is the only possible way to have uh, uh, goals individually or societally in the kind of future that we imagine is going to be created. Um, so I, I make that argument for a eudaimonic uh, view of happiness and that then turns to well, what are those aspects of human character that we want to develop and so that g returns to a question of virtue and the, what are the virtues. Um, I then try to develop, a, a, which is already happening all over the place, but a, a kind of a psychologically and neurologically grounded model of human virtue, um, the importance of self-control, the importance of empathy, uh, what the uh, uh, neurochemicals are, what the drugs are, what the neural structures are that go into the development or the support of these different kinds of human capabilities, and, and look at it from a sociological point of view and say, you know, again, I'm not trying to argue that virtue in and of itself uh, is self-evidently good. 
but almost all of us recognize that our ability to control our own behavior uh, furthers our own goals. And, um, and so there are, there's a kind of self-validating nature to a lot of these things. Uh, other questions, I mean, like our uh, fellow Andrea Kajushi, she's written some great stuff about uh, courage and excessive courage, being stupid. So there's a lot, a lot, you know, there's a lot of things to, in, when you interrogate virtue ethics, and, which has been going on for thousands of years, that um, the need for balance between virtues, that you can't just be compassionate without reason, you need to always have, a, you know, that balance within the virtues. Um, so that's a part of that whole question as well. But then the ultimate question is, well, okay, given this model and what we know about the brain, are there drugs, devices that we're already using, like ADD drugs, uh, like uh, oxytocin, the research is going on in oxytocin, that could be used systematically in the future? Um, uh, even if we didn't, even if the goal isn't to enhance human virtue, which freaks a lot of people out if we say we're going to enhance human virtue, say, well, if you were just given access to these drugs and you were told, this one will increase your self-control, this one will suppress your addiction to X, Y, and Z, this one will make you more empathetic to other people's feelings, don't even talk about it in a moralistic sense. What will people do? They're going to be likely to want to use these in ways that enhance what we call virtues. Um, and so that's the, the positive upshot. And the final part of the book is about the effect on our sense of self, because for me, transhumanism, it's the ethics of transhumanism around life extension and, uh, and bodily enhancement is kind of boring, actually, because uh, most people, you know, the, the arguments that they come up with about why it would be bad to live a long time are just, you know, so easy to knock around. Um, but when you get to the questions of, well, if I give you a drug that actually changed your memories, you know, and you decided that you were going to erase every negative memory that you have, what effect would that have on our lives? You know, what effect would it have on our sense of identity, on our moral, you know, for me, remembering some of the terrible things that I've done by accident and sometimes intentionally to people is a part of my own moral character today. And if I was to systematically erase those memories, I don't think it would have a positive effect on my moral character. On the other hand, I think people should have a right to control their own brains. So, so where do you go with that? So those are some really interesting questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I personally wouldn't give up my negative memories because, in fact, this is how we learn most of the time, I think. Uh, you know, you have to make a mistake and, and sometimes you, you pay for it. And, and this is how, this is part of the learning process, I think. And, and especially when it comes to, to moral or, or ethical sort of uh, progress that you can make individually and, and grow personally as a, as a positive character, if you remove that possibility, how do you ever grow? How do you ever make progress? I, 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 that for, on, the, on the other hand, as you mentioned, people should have freedom to change their brain the way they see fit. Right. So it's a, it's a serious dilemma here, yes. Right. Well, I think that this gets to, uh, you know, I, I have a more nuanced view of drug de decriminalization than I used to. I used to just think, you know, de legalize them, the consequences of drug criminalization are too great. Mm -hmm. I think it, we need a more nuanced view because it, we do have a legitimate need and right to have, uh, to encourage uh, our fellow human beings to live fulfilling lives. Mm -hmm. And so if we, we look on other people who are addicted to crack or heroin, um, or what's coming down the pike, which would be worse than crack and heroin, more addictive, more uh, fundamentally personality changing. Um, uh, uh, if we don't say, look, I think this is a problem and we need to do what we can to help you, uh, without going to the point of saying, we're gonna lock you up in prison or we're gonna you know, kill you or whatever, uh, but you know, what, what, what can we, what lines can we go up to to create moral uh, sanction and social support and public health support for people so that they move their lives in positive directions as opposed to falling into these sand traps? But here's my, my thing with this uh, uh, here. Uh, I think in this case we're talking more about sort of a uh, physiological enhancement, not so much about the moral one, because I think there's a clearly physiological dependency that we're talking about. It's not really psychological, it's not really moral. I mean, many of those people morally may hate drugs and may want to stop doing them, but it's just physiologically they're entirely dependent on that. Well, 
I think that this is a long-standing debate in sociology about the uh, medicalization, um, how, which uh, social agencies or institutions get to define and control social problems. So it used to be that alcohol was considered purely a moral problem. And then in the 20th century, well, uh, you know, it went before the 20th century. Sure, sure, yes. If, if, you, if someone was a drunkard, it was just considered their moral failing. It wasn't considered yes. a disease. And then in the 20th century, we created this notion that there was a disease of alcoholism and you could suffer from that. And it took away some of the moral sanction uh, from alcoholism. Um, and, and I think the next step would be that if we come up with, you know, as we already do have uh, buprenorphine and some of these other drugs that, um, that make it easier for people to give up alcohol dependence, um, if we can fix the brain of people who are chemically dependent, um, then you really would have a fully medicalized context and say, well, you, you don't have a moral failing, you have the problem of alcohol or chemical dependence, and you need to go and take this particular drug and it'll fix your brain. Um, and that's progress. But it doesn't take away from the fact that being at one of the pro reasons why we don't want to be alcohol dependent or chemically dependent is that it leads to us doing things to ourselves and to other people that are in fact moral, have moral consequences. We drunk, drive drunk and kill people. We uh, don't pick up our kids from school and they, you know, and, and they fall in a ditch or whatever. Um, and so when we have a sense of moral obligation that our life has to go in a certain direction, the reason why chemical dependence is a problem is because it gets in the way of those things. So maybe we could uh, stop at this point and see who has questions. Any questions about this? Uh, there's a whole other part of the interview about uh, Buddhism and you know Buddhist thought and and how it uh, interacts with many of these concepts. I wanted to point out that when you compare David Pierce um, with the thoughts that we're hearing about today, uh, it all comes down to the thing about designer babies. He says that in about 20 seconds or 10, and the, the phrase is out there. And if you accept that we're going to have designer babies, and we're all going to have designer babies, and it's going to be soon, and it's going to be easy, and there'll be all sorts of ways to do it, then his uh, construct makes a lot of sense and is relevant and so on. But he points out that he thinks, I mean, what he says in writing, David Pierce, is that the singularity and other technological changes will likely outpace whatever pace we think, you know, designer babyism is going to proceed at. And so maybe these things that he's conceiving of won't be, a, you know, dominant part of the future just because we, we won't get to that point where having uh, designer babies picking the exact genome of our uh, offspring won't be the thing that we're doing first, you know? We'll, we'll come to that later. Um, so depending upon what you think about how soon we'll have, you know, designer babies, then David Pierce's ideas are, are relevant and current right now, or they're like something for when that, when that happens. Um, so, do one, one of you, come on, come on, come forward. Yay, okay. So here comes Stefan, he's uh, the youngest person in the class. Hi. Um, I'm just curious on how would one go about measuring progress? Because, I mean, there's a lot of aspects to it. And like you said earlier in that TED Talks, when he, that guy was, like, hiding or whatever, he decided to measure the progress. Like, what did he look at to measure how much progress has been made? Well, Steven Pinker's uh, metric, uh, again, it doesn't answer the fundamental um, naturalistic fallacy problem, which is that you can prove anything you want uh, through science, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you've proven that it's good or bad. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what Steven Pinker's premise was is that the decline in violence is 
probably a good idea, a good thing. And um, is there any way to measure that and to prove that? And so he collected all kinds of archaeological and historical data that shows that there has been a decline in con uh, intra-state conflict, such as there used to be states. I mean, they, they, they didn't always look like countries do today. Um, and a decline in uh, domestic violence, you know, that uh, women uh, and children used to be subject to violence that they're not subject to today. And, and you can prove that um, for our ancestors, the ones before history started, by looking at their bones, because all kinds of, uh, of their bones show that they, in fact, died violent deaths, and, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent, uh, whereas up to today, it's a fraction of a percent of, of us who die violent deaths, even during wartime. Um, so I think that, that that's an example of the kind of uh, question that you have to ask. Do you and I agree that the decline of violence is a good idea? If we do, then we can try to figure out whether we're making progress, and it seems that we are. Um, do we agree that uh, not believing that your own uh, worldview is the absolute only worldview and that everyone else is going to hell is a good idea. Not all of us agree that that's a good idea, but if we agree, then we can look around and see whether more and more people are thinking that way, and I think that more and more people are. So, I, again, you just have to start from first premises. Make, make your first premise. What is the kind of progress that you're going to look for? And, and uh, in many cases, you can find it. Yeah, so I, I kind of, uh, talking about premise, I, I kind of have the premise that we should have at least one question from virtually everybody in the room. Uh, you know, Victor, do you want to? <laughs> I, I hope I'm not picking people at the exact moment that their minds are completely blank, but <laughs> I don't well, think that so. Be, that'd be very Zen of you. <laughs> Zen Hello. guru teacher. Hi, um, I'd like to ask a question related to the end of your TED talk, um, and it's about technology and employment, right? And you mentioned how over the past, I forgot how many years, you began to see a decrease in employment in things like manual labor because technology has replaced those jobs. You know, automated processes, manual labor are getting increasingly more and more um, replaced by technology more than humans, right? And the ideal situation is we have machines doing all the tedious manual labor and us humans um, doing all the more intellectual uh, work, right? But do you think we humans can ever catch up um, with this notion given that, you know, technological advancements are very quick right now? Like, you know, you have Moore's Law, um, processing speed doubling every, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. Um, yes, we humans are, enhanced, are enhancing ourselves too. We are developing, you know, memory enhancement drugs, attention enhancement drugs, um, anti-aging therapy, that type of stuff. But do you think at the rate at which we're going right now, we can outpace technology and, you know, become on the top? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, uh, Kim, did you assign Werner Vinge's singularity essay as a part of your course? Because it's... No, I, I guess uh, it, it's in the kind of background, but no, they, they weren't... Uh, they don't have a lot of uh, required reading. reading. They can sort of pursue whatever their uh, specific interest is. Yeah. Well, the, uh, back in 19... I guess he started the essay in 1989, but uh, the published version that he gave at NASA was 1992, and that uh, was the first talk that really popularized the notion of a singularity. He defined a singularity as the point at which artificial intelligence would um, uh, have greater intelligence than a human brain. And of course, then you say, well, artificial intelligence in what? In a network of computers, in a, in a supercomputer? Um, and a lot of the singularitarians talk about it in terms of in a desktop machine. So at what point would the, the machine in front of you on your, on your desk have more processing power than a human brain? And people are estimating that at 2030, 2040, something like that. 
Ray Kurzweil and other people um, have, have tried to do those calculations. We still don't understand how the human brain works and you know, what the relevant calculations would be in a computer. But even if we're off by an order of magnitude, it would just push it up because of the, the Moore's law that you referenced, it would push it up uh, a couple years instead of, you know, not a, a, instead of decades or centuries. Um, okay, so if that's true, then the, uh, the age-old dream, because this, this dream that human labor could be eliminated goes back to the Enlightenment. Uh, you, you see people like Condorcet and um, uh, Tom Paine in the United States and, and other Enlightenment thinkers imagining that the improvements in agricultural labor that they saw around them, which were driving people off of the farm because uh, one guy with a plow could do what, you know, what took two before, um, and then the cotton loom in the early 19th century and the, the Luddite Rebellion, all kinds of people began to imagine that automation of labor would um, eliminate employment. What they didn't imagine was the growth of the service sector, the growth of managerial occupations, the growth of science and higher education, nonprofits, and all kinds of things like that. Things that sucked up a lot of employment um, as people lost jobs in industry and in agriculture. So um, then the question is, well, what, are the, what is the nature of the work, the white collar work that people got into after they were forced out of agricultural labor and industrial labor? Uh, is that work immune to uh, automation? And I think basically there's two kinds of work. There's work with your hands and work with your brain. Uh, we, we haven't, it, there's emotional work, some, you know, people do some emotional work and people have suggested, for instance, that one of the kinds of work that might be immune to automation would be prostitution and uh, psychotherapy because uh, who would want a robot or, uh, you know, to do one or the other of those jobs? Well, it turns out uh, there's a book by uh, Le a scientist named Levy, Sex and Love with Robots, there are probably lots of people who would prefer to have sex with robots than to have sex with other human beings uh, for a whole variety of, of reasons. And psychotherapy uh, through artificial intelligence, uh, just like medicine in general through artificial intelligence, turns out to have uh, probably a lot of advantages than tr to try to rely on a human being for that particular service. So I don't think that there, in the end, is any occupation that we can imagine for human beings in an economy which is completely immune from the effects of growing automation, the automation of, of robotics and also the automation of expert systems and artificial intelligence. Um, that means that we have to figure out uh, in this coming century what it means to have a functioning economy without uh, mass starvation, social unrest, Luddite revolts, um, when there's going to be a decline in, of employability, not just employment, but employability. There just won't be jobs. Be and we've already seen that. You know, in the United States, the percentage of the population in, in the uh, paid labor force has been declining since 2000. It accelerated after the 2008 economic collapse, but it just keeps going down. It's, you know, as it got up to a high, when women entered the labor force after World War II, they began the percentage of the population in the labor force increased to a high of about 66%, and it's just been going down since then. And then folks are going to start retiring, the baby boomers are going to start retiring, and there won't be any jobs for, you know, people talk about raising the retirement age, but there won't be any jobs for those seniors to, to find. So your generation, and, prob and hopefully, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm at the end of the baby boom, so I, I hope to be able to retire. But your generation may never be able to retire because you're going to live a heck of a lot longer than we are. And um, uh, we're going to have to renegotiate what it means to, to be a citizen and get stuff so that it doesn't have to be connected to doing work. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the key point. You can't, you can't have to do work to get stuff in, the, in our society. We haven't figured out how to do that yet. Right. One of, one of the interesting points that uh, Robin Hanson makes that, that's quite practical is that uh, when you have a large segment of the society that's not working and has stuff 
and, and is, not, is, you might say, technically non-productive in, in that way. They have valuable things and they're not working. Um, so is there a danger that we would kill off people like that and uh, take their stuff? Well, apparently not, because, you know, retirees are in that category right now. They, meant many of them are not working. They're not uh, directly contributing to the workforce. They have stuff. And because we like society the way it is, we don't, you know, attack uh, retirees and take their stuff. So are, are we talking about a world where most of us will be in that category of not working, having stuff? Uh, in a, you know, Peter Diamandis' uh, world of abundance and post-scarcity, the resources will be there for all, all of us somehow. We will figure out how to divide them up. But in uh, the opinions, I suppose, of a lot of other people, they're not sure we're going to get there fast enough. <laughs> there may be a period of, of a lot of strife where, as you say, there just aren't enough jobs. And uh, when, when you read things written about uh, automation, you know, there's a famous uh, book that came out in 1947 about uh, the ultimate effects of uh, automation. If you read the introduction to that book and then read about the Foxconn uh, plan to replace, you know, one million workers with uh, robots, that book appears to be really prescient and, 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 and extremely relevant to what's going on today. But people also point out, well, you know, look, this guy in 1949 wasn't talking about 2012, he was talking about the next few uh, decades that he thought there would be massive uh, unemployment due to uh, automation, and it didn't actually happen. So you can argue that we're crying wolf, but I have a feeling that we're not crying wolf now. I mean, isn't it very likely that unless things are extremely well-timed in terms of when abundance and post-scarcity comes, we're going to go through a very tough time where we don't have these new paradigms of paying everybody to be on permanent uh, vacation. We haven't set that in place yet, but yet the number of jobs is, is um, plummeting. So do you see, like I do, that the, that the, the you know, sync synchronicity isn't going to work out quite right. There, there is going to be a period of time when this, this employment business will be a serious problem. Frederick Douglass said, without struggle, there is no progress. And yeah. um, one of the problems with techno-utopians like Diamandis or uh, Ray Kurzweil, a, a lot of the folks who talk about the singularity, is that they imagine, like the, the Fabians used to, that we could just... Uh, painlessly evolve towards the kind of uh, uh, superabundance and uh, lack of work that, that, that they imagine also we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be painless. Uh, there's going to be a lot of folks who are going to want to hold on to their stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the debate today. I mean, there's the, they, they don't make the connection between the current debates over austerity and entitlements and this, this language of uh, entitlements and what kind of society we're gonna to have to create. We're gonna to have to create a society in which everyone has a basic income guarantee, in which the, the state continues to exist and it continues to extract income from someplace and it figures out how to get that income to everybody who needs it to eat and have uh, and housing. And if you think that what we need to, d to be debating today is how to get everybody off of the dole and uh, <laughs> off of Social Security and off of Medicare and, and all of that, then you're moving in the wrong direction and you're not seeing the connection between yeah. the world that you think, in th you know, Diamandis thinks that his world's gonna be in the next like 20 or 30 years. And he doesn't see the connection between the politics that we need to be fighting for today and the kind of future that he wants to create, right? But he doesn't want to see that connection. There's a, he's fundamentally incapable of seeing that connection because these rich 
entrepreneurs and engineers, they don't want to have people engage in uh, you know, a struggle for uh, a more progressive income tax or for a basic income guarantee or to protect the social uh, wage. So there, this is a fundamental political problem that um, you know, the, the left has to be reconnected with technological optimism. It, it fell out of that camp a long time ago after World War II, it, it decided that there was never going to be a machine which was going to uh, be anything good for women or workers or, or black people or the poor. Um, and uh, that was wrong. And the techno-optimists need to be reconnected with the 200-year-old conversation about the connection between political change and technological change. Because it's not going to be this painless Oh, here, everybody, have a magic nano box, and you can take out of it whatever you want, and then we'll have, we have no need for social and political change. Yes. Well, now, to what extent is it all a matter of bad timing, and to what extent does the dirty word of, you know, elitism enter in here? Do you, do you think the uh, Peter Diamandis uh, vision with the, that will never get there, or that a small segment will, and that a huge segment won't. How, how do you, is it all timing, or is it some of it uh, division here? Well, the, the, I think there's a matter of the exoteric doctrine and the esoteric doctrine. Mm -hmm. The exoteric doctrine, the, the doctrine for the masses, is that everybody's going to get a magic nanobox, and no one will have to starve. The esoteric doctrine is that the very wealthy and the very clued in will be able to move on to their, uh, their floating island nations in the Pacific on garbage scows uh, mm -hmm. with their uh, you know, super nano weapons and their, their brain drugs and uh, let the rest of the world sink into a morass of uh, Ayn Randian despair. Um, you know, yes. th literally, th there is a lot of Ayn Rand uh, uh, in that particular camp. I mean, you look at the, the phenomenon of Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. the um, Christian conservative transhumanist uh, libertarian. The, the principal fund, uh, funder of Ron Paul, our right-wing Christian anti-abortion libertarian candidate for, for president. Um, and he, his vision is that, uh, you know, first he wants to live in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to get away from all of us democracy lovers, and then he wants to move into space. Um, and, yes. and I'm sure that he's not alone. Uh, it's just that he's uh, much more bold about talking about it. Yeah. Well, I, we have uh, one minute left. This uh, classroom holds 400 people. We have many fewer than that in our class, but the class coming is 400, and they can uh, uh, trample us in unpleasant ways if we're, if we're not uh, out of here. So I, I, I want to thank you very, very much. We have a very broad concept of what the future of medicine is. The one question you may be left with is how what we did today has to do with the future of medicine. I assure you that as we define the future of medicine here, it's, it's directly relevant. So you don't need to feel, feel any guilt that you caused us to stray let, from, from the main. Let, let me just say one last word about that. Yeah. One way to stay ahead of the robots is to make sure that you're as smart as possible so, and as healthy as possible. So that's the future of medicine. We all have to be on our game. Right. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm deeply appreciative. Okay. My pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Thanks.